Hey, India. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Robin. What were you saying? I said hi. Hi. And I wanted to see why I don't have video. There we go. There we go. Cool. Sorry, my audio wasn't connected right. So, but yeah. No worries. I forgot to mute myself. Thanks. Testing audio one, two, three. Robin in India, can you hear me okay? Hey, Mike. Yes. Thank you. So, is this going to be recorded? Okay. Absolutely. Can folks hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We wouldn't we would not have you not join us for the world. I didn't come out right. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Good afternoon, everyone. I have it being 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, we will give everyone another minute or two to log on. We will start the presentation at 3.02 p.m. Thank you. Good, out, good afternoon, everyone. I have it being 3.01 p.m. We will give everyone another minute to log on and we will start the presentation at 3.02 p.m. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Mike Ebrzinskis. I'm director of the Division of Air Quality within the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Welcome to this information session on the advanced clean trucks rulemaking process, a key step in transforming the state to a clean energy economy. We're pleased that you're taking time out of your busy day to join us. Next slide, please. We are viewing today's presentation as an opportunity to provide all of you with foundational knowledge about Executive Order 271, the Advanced Clean Trucks Program, and the importance of reducing emissions from the transportation sector, now the leading source sector of greenhouse gases in North Carolina. We'll then discuss the Clean Air Act provisions that our staff will be looking at as we draft these rules. Importantly, We'll also outline the upcoming opportunities for you to participate and be heard in a robust stakeholder process that will take place prior to the official rulemaking public process. We're looking forward to those future engagement opportunities. It's going to be a great opportunity. It's going to take great partnerships, great two way communications and information sharing that will help us design a program that benefits and provides opportunities for all. We'll provide the detailed schedule for those opportunities later in the presentation today. So speaking of great partnerships, I'm now gonna hand things over to our colleague, Zach Pierce, Climate Policy Advisor in the Governor's Office to lead off the presentation. So Zach, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, appreciate that introduction. Um, also wanna thank the staff at NCDEQ for pulling together today's conversation and the series of stakeholder engagement opportunities that we have uh, in the coming months it takes a lot of work behind the scenes and we're really excited about kicking off this conversation in earnest. Um, so, as Mike mentioned, I serve as a senior advisor to Governor Cooper focused on climate change and clean energy issues and. I'd like to spend a few minutes this afternoon speaking to the broader context of today's session on advanced clean trucks. Over the past six years, Governor Cooper has provided ambitious leadership confronting the climate crisis, advancing environmental justice, and growing our state's clean energy economy. And this slide provides a snapshot of some of the notable actions that the Cooper administration has taken. So going all the way back to 2018, which seems like a lifetime ago now, the governor issued Executive Order 80, uh, which really established this administration's first 
greenhouse gas targets statewide, and also set the first goal for zero emission vehicle adoption targets, as well as energy efficiency uh, in, uh, in state buildings. The order also directed numerous actions across state agencies to help to achieve these new newly established goals that, that have been set. One example of this is the development of the North Carolina Clean Energy Plan that I'm sure folks on this line are, are familiar with um, that ultimately informed House Bill 951, um, which was signed into law over a year ago now and has led to the carbon plan, which was recently released by our Utilities Commission. Zooming forward a little bit to the summer of 2020, in July of that year, Governor Cooper signed on to a multi-state memorandum of understanding with, at the time, 15 other states that has grown. Uh, but this MOU was really focused on supporting the transition to medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles, um, or medium and heavy duty ZEVs, uh, as, which is a topic that we'll be discussing in great detail this afternoon. Um, as part of that effort, North Carolina worked with other states to develop an action plan uh, that has that includes dozens of potential strategies and actions that the state can pursue to really support this market transition. Continue towards uh, about a year ago, January of 2022, the governor issued Executive Order 246. This was a sweeping uh, climate and environmental justice executive order. Um, that directed numerous actions um, uh, to transition the state to clean energy and reduce emissions in a manner that centers environmental justice and maximizes the health and economic benefits for all North Carolinians. So this order set new greenhouse gas targets. It updated the state's light duty zero emission vehicle sales targets and stock targets. Um, and for purposes of this discussion, also kicked off the development of the state's first clean transportation plan, which is being led by our Department of Transportation in an effort that really is going to be closely coordinated with this advanced clean trucks discussion. And then finally, just this past October, the governor issued Executive Order 271, um, which I'll discuss further in the next two slides. So we can go ahead to uh, jump to the next slide. So we're here today because of Executive Order 271, which was signed by the governor last October. And before I go into detail about exactly what the executive order does, I thought I'd speak just briefly about the motivation to support this transition to medium and heavy duty ZEVs in North Carolina. As many on the line may know, North Carolina is a national leader in the manufacturing and supply chain development for medium and heavy duty vehicles today. And the reality is that the market is quickly moving towards zero emission vehicle technology. All you have to do is look at the ZEV commitments from major manufacturers and fleet owners, coupled with declining technology costs and unprecedented levels of public funding support to really see that this transition is not a matter of if, if it's a, mat it's a matter of when, and in the near term, it's a matter of where. We want to do everything that we can to ensure that this global market transition leads to local economic development and job growth in North Carolina and is cleaning up North Carolina's air. In addition to supporting economic growth and the clean energy economy, we also want to make sure that North Carolina businesses have access to these newer, cleaner, and increasingly more affordable vehicles. And as I'll talk about further on the next slide, Executive Order 271 takes steps to help ensure that the state is ready and prepared to accommodate these vehicles, both through making sure that we have available inventory and also through other market needs like building out the necessary charging infrastructure. As Mike already alluded to, um, it's imperative that we clean up this sector, these medium and heavy duty vehicles, if we want to achieve our climate and environmental justice goals. And this is another really important part of this conversation. Medium and heavy duty vehicles today are the most frequently used and often the most polluting vehicles on the road. They comprise just over 3% of North Carolina's registered vehicles, but are responsible for a significant amount of air pollution. And you're going to hear from some of our experts from DAQ more about that um, this afternoon. These vehicles are also the transportation sector's second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after, after passenger cars. So it's a really important sector when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions and, and doing our part in confronting the climate crisis. 
And as we know, while climate change and the impacts of local air pollution harm all of us, they disproportionately impact people of color, low-income communities, and other underserved communities. So let's jump to the next slide and talk a little bit more about the specifics of Executive Order 271. So section one of the order is the main focus of today's conversation. Uh, and this section directs the Department of Environmental Quality to work with stakeholders, including all the stakeholders on the line today, to propose to our Environmental Management Commission an advanced clean trucks program that would ensure zero emission trucks and buses and vans are available for purchase here in North Carolina. So we're gonna get into a lot more detail, but just as a, as a high level overview, advanced clean trucks would require the manufacturers of these vehicles to sell an increasing percentage of zero emission options over time, while also providing flexibility through credits, trading, and other features as segments of the market grow at different speeds. We also think that these sales targets are really important because they'll drive investment in other zero emission technologies, including charging infrastructure, and also enhance consumer choice while bolstering North Carolina's competitiveness in seeking the billions of dollars in federal funding for clean energy development that we're seeing through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Next slide, please. But we know that you, you can't just require the manufacturers to sell these vehicles without doing a lot of other things to ensure a healthy market and growing the demand for the vehicles. And that's where all of the other sections, these sections through two through seven come into play. And I'm not gonna go into um, all of these sections in great detail, but do wanna highlight that the Cooper administration is trying to use all of the tools in our toolbox from a state government perspective to ensure that this transition happens in an equitable, affordable and reliable manner. So let's start with sections two and three. Um, these two sections outline a strategy for the state to support our automakers, our fleet owners, and other partners grow this market through the investment in charging infrastructure, purchase incentives, workforce development, technical assistance, and other strategies identified through the North Carolina clean transportation planning process um, that I already mentioned supported by unprecedented federal funding and also informed by the medium and heavy duty strategies, uh, the MOU strategies that I previously mentioned. As I spoke to, the pollution from these vehicles disproportionately harms low income communities and communities of color that are most often working and living near trucking corridors, distribution hubs and other places frequented by these vehicles. And so the order provides clear direction for cabinet agencies to elevate strategies that will further environmental justice and health equity by improving health outcomes for communities impacted by this air pollution and increasing affordable access to clean transportation options. And so that's really where section four comes in, which um, does a number of things, including directing our Department of Health and Human Services to take steps to further our administration's understanding and the public's understanding of exactly where these disproportionate health impacts are taking place. Um, as we advance our understanding there, we can better and more effectively direct resources to where they are needed most and to fulfill our commitment to environmental justice. Moving to section five, the zero emission vehicle infrastructure needs assessment. It's a bit of a mouthful, but stated plainly, we need to make sure that we have adequate charging infrastructure in place to support the advent of these new vehicle technologies. And so this needs assessment is going to help us identify charging and fueling needs, including the grid infrastructure needs to support the sales targets that are in the advanced clean truck program. Moving to section six, this section re really reiterates, I would say, a focus of this administration since executive order 80, which is really doing what we can to walk the talk when it comes to clean energy deployment um, and climate action. And so this section encourages our cabinet agencies to transition their all of their vehicles, specifically their, their medium and heavy duty vehicles to zero emission technologies, including those buses and trucks covered by the advanced clean trucks program. And finally, section seven um, under the order directs our Department of Environmental Quality to enhance a longstanding public private partnership program 
that they have um, developed called the Environmental Stewardship Initiative to support and recognize companies and facilities that increase the share of their zero emission vehicles in their medium and heavy duty fleets. So we wanna make sure that we're sharing information across the public and private sectors, um, sharing resource and technical assistance to support a successful transition. So I know I just ran through a lot of material, but um, the, the main takeaway is that this advanced clean trucks program is a part of a broader strategy to support this state's transition to clean energy, to reduce pollution, reduce emissions, uh, and do it in a way that is informed by robust stakeholder engagement that we're kicking off uh, with today's webinar. So thank you for being here today, um, spending your precious time learning more about what we're doing and why. And with that, I'll turn it over um, to my colleague, Robin, with the Department of Air Quality. Thanks, Zach. Um, I am Robin Barrows. I'm with the Division of Air Quality. Um, and just to pick up where Zach left off, we have been working um, for the last several years um, in concert with other states and other sister agencies um, regarding medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles. Um, so as part of the executive actions, the Department of Transportation was directed to develop the clean transportation plan. And the Division of Air Quality was most involved with the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle work group. Um, we led a variety of efforts um, and we discussed a variety of items in our work groups. And we took the regional action plan that was developed um, amongst the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle memorandum of understanding states, and that's a mouthful, um, which contains 60 recommendations. And we've taken a look at those and, um, and we're reviewing those lists to consider recommendations for adoption in the clean transportation plan. And the advanced clean trucks rulemaking will become a significant piece to that particular chapter of the clean transportation plan. Next slide, please. So moving forward to discuss at a high level, the advanced clean trucks rule. The advanced clean trucks regulation is part of California's holistic approach to accept a large scale transition of zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles from class 2B to class 8, resulting in, green, in decreases in the greenhouse gases, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and sulfur dioxide emissions from this particular source sector, sector over time. While the regulation has two parts, um, truck sales and reporting, um, the one that is most important to us in North Carolina is that manufacturers would be required to sell zero emission vehicles at an increasing percentage between now and 2035, and percentages vary by class. And we'll talk about that more a little bit in the future. Um, but I do want to remind you that this portion of what I'm discussing right now is the California rule and North Carolina is assessing our rulemaking requirements for future. Next slide, please. So we can't talk about any of this without reminding everyone and many of you on the call already know about this of what these trucks are. So class 2B through class eight means anywhere from a heavy duty pickup truck, which is class 2B, to a truck trailer, which is class eight. These are all divided by gross vehicle weight rating. Basically, that's how much they weigh. So they're all divided into weight classes. So for instance, you could have an Amazon delivery step van or a large hauling pickup truck. And on the other hand, you'll have a cement truck, which could be a class seven or a class eight, or a long haul trailer. Um, many manufacturers that sell vehicles in these weight classes have already committed to selling zero emission vehicles in increasing numbers of the state. And that's uh, something that Jack Ar Zach already alluded to. Next slide, please.
So these are sales targets that the advanced lean trucks would require. The onus is on the manufacturers of vehicles, not the buyers or the vendors to achieve these targets. Manufacturers can trade credits and California has developed a tracking system that we can use in North Carolina. And there's other details related to the program that we're not going to cover today, but will be part of the presentation in our future rulemaking process. Now, I, I will note that North Carolina's entry in this proposed advanced clean trucks rule would be model year 2027. Next slide, please. So we've already had a lot of um, ways that we've been working on reducing emissions from the medium and heavy duty sectors across the state. Several years ago, we entered into the Volkswagen settlement and the Division of Air Quality is the lead agency on administering these settlement funds. It's complementary piece to the overall reductions of nitrogen oxides and greenhouse gas emissions. In phase one, um, we awarded over $30 million and a lot of those projects are already underway and have already been funded. Phase two is in process right now, and we have $63 million that is either being awarded or is going to be awarded in the next few years so that people can um, transition to cleaner vehicles. And many of these include zero emission vehicles. For instance, in the clean transit buses, we had 61 projects that we awarded and 25 of those are going to be uh, electric vehicle replacements. Um, and in both phase one and phase two, the state energy office provides supplemental funding to help with infrastructure for these particular projects. There's other active funding opportunities. We have the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, which is an annual funding stream that the Division of Air Quality utilizes to help clean, um, to help provide clean diesel engines um, in this sector. And finally, under the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Plan, uh, we expect, North Carolina expects to receive $109 million to build out the EV infrastructure across the state. And that just started this year. Next slide, please. So we can't talk about any of this without also talking about um, the environmental justice communities that are impacted by medium heavy duty vehicles. So environmental justice communities include the potentially underserved communities shown in a kind of pinkish color on this map, the tribal communities, which are outlined in a bold black, and the limited English proficiency communities, which are shown in this lighter blue color. Overlaid on this map are the interstates that go across, the major interstates that go across our states. And you can see that there's a correlation between the environmental justice communities and where these interstates lie. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the annual um, daily truck traffic in 2014. And I know this is a little dated, but this is data from the North Carolina D Department of Transportation. Um, they shared their information with me kindly. Um, so you can see that most of our interstates and highways transport goods within and across our state. So it comes from other states and goes through our state. Um, this information provides us with a pretty clear picture of where the medium and heavy duty vehicles are and where they're used and what industry types rely on them most. Next slide, please. This slide shows the manufacturing um, across the state. Manufacturing is most densely populated in the middle of the state, as you can see by this slide. And we have a lot of different manufacturers in North Carolina, like those that manufacture chemicals, electronics, fabricated metals, furniture, wood, and leather products. Next slide, please.
this particular slide shows that um, that associated with manufacturing are your distribution centers and warehousing needed to store and transfer these products across the state. So again, you can see that they're closely correlated with your manufacturing. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have the slide that shows the wholesale trade across the state. Wholesale trade is a business activity that involves buying products in bulk and then selling them in smaller, smaller quantities to retailers. We included this sector from DOT because it's reliant on the medium and heavy duty vehicles to transfer products amongst the producers and the sellers. So this just gives us a nice overview of where the communities, the environmental justice communities are, where the interstates are across the state, and where most of our transportation um, with the medium and heavy duty vehicles are going across the state. So as we transition to zero emission vehicles in these source sectors, we will have less of an of, uh, impact on the communities in these areas. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Randy, who's going to talk about um, the emissions that are coming from these areas. Randy? Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I want to touch on uh, the, our, this, our North Carolina's greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. And we completed this work. Uh, the division included this, or department include, completed this work um, a year ago. And we plan to update the report next year, but um, one of the kind of touch on uh, what the, some of the key sectors of our greenhouse gas inventory and forecast is and the role of medium heavy duty vehicles in that, in that, uh, um, in the forecast or the, um, the total statewide emissions. So this is a, just a fact sheet highlighting some of the key findings from the report. Um, our focus was on improving or updating uh, the transportation electricity um, and then the industrial and commercial sectors. And uh, this is showing the gross greenhouse gas emissions in 2018 for, um, for each of these sectors. And as, as indicated here, transportation is in 2018 accounted for 36% of the statewide gross greenhouse gas emissions, um, followed by the electricity and then the industrial sectors. And some of the key takeaways between 2005 and 2018, uh, North Carolina reduced net greenhouse gas emissions by 23%, while the state's population increased by 19% and its real gross state product increased by 24%. So we can continue to grow the economy or we've been successful growing the economy while uh, decreasing emissions. And that's a major objective of, um, of the administration as we go forward with looking at further reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And by 2030, net greenhouse gas emissions are forecast to decrease by 39% relative to 2005 baseline emissions. And this does include uh, the uh, reductions uh, in CO2 emissions um, called for by House Bill 951 for the power sector. And the transportation sector, um, as I indicated, indica now accounts for 36% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions and is projected to decrease emissions at a much lower rate compared to the projected decrease in, in the electricity generation emissions by 2030. Um, next slide, please. So just here's just another look at, at our greenhouse gas inventory data and um, what we did, what this, what we're doing here is just showing 2018 when we prepared this inventory and forecast was the last year, the latest, most recent year for which we had historical data that we could use to estimate, estimate emissions uh, for all sectors. And then from there, we, we did some projections out to 2030. So this is just comparing the historical to the projected. And um, as you can see, um, while emissions for the energy generation sector, which is that orange um, uh, part of the uh, of the graph at the bottom, are projected to continue the decline, uh, the transportation sector emissions, which are shown in gray, remain fairly constant throughout the, uh, the, in the next uh, 10 to 12 years. So this is important. Um, we've identified new, that we identify new strategies to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions from our on-road vehicles if we are to achieve our climate goals. 
Next slide, please. Okay. This slide is just showing the breakdown of the on-road vehicle emissions uh, contribution to the total transportation sector uh, for 2018. And this is again in gross greenhouse. Uh, this is gross, or yeah, greenhouse gas, gross greenhouse gas emission. The medium duty vehicle, medium heavy duty diesel vehicles um, account for uh, 16 percent. That's the red kind of uh, piece of the pie there. And then there's a couple of other smaller slices associated with gasoline vehicles, um, medium heavy duty gasoline vehicles and uh, compressed natural gas. So overall, they contribute about 17% to the total transportation sector emissions in 2018. Um, but as, as Zach alluded to earlier, um, this is um, the medium heavy duty vehicles make up just over 3% uh, of the state's registered vehicles. So on a per vehicle basis, there are significant emitters. In any effort to reduce transportation, GHG emissions, um, we really need to look at these, uh, the medium heavy duty vehicle sector. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then the other thing is these, these uh, medium heavy duty vehicles are also, as Robin indicated, sources of other pollutants. So I wanted to talk about PM25 and, um, not, and nitrogen oxide emissions. Next slide, please. So the 32% uh, of North Carolina's on-road fine particulate matter emissions, or PM25, um, are estimated to come from the medium heavy duty vehicles. And although we are currently in attainment statewide with the PM25 standards, um, EPA, as of Friday, last Friday morning, announced a proposal to lower the uh, annual PM25 standard. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. There you go, thanks. This is showing um, uh, the concentration is in the left hand or in the right hand side of the chart showing the level or concentration of PM25 in the ambient air. Um, and what this is is mapping or charting uh, for each of our monitors that we have in the state, there's 17 or so, um, the design values, which is based on a three year average of the constant fourth highest concentration. And this is just comparing where our monitors are to the current standard, which is shown at the very top, that red dotted line at the very top of the graph at 12 micrograms per cubic meter. And then the EPA has proposed a range of nine to 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So all of our monitors, except for one uh, down in the Mecklenburg area is, is uh, below eight. Um, and uh, there's one that's um, just over nine. So um, it's important to note that by the time EPA finalizes the standard and goes through, works with the states to go through the designation process, we'll be using monitoring data for 2022 through 2024 that determine that design value for attainment with the new standard. So it's important that we continue to um, uh, do everything we can to maintain and further reduce our PM25 emissions to make sure we are in attainment with that standard in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, you can go to the next slide, India. Um, this, okay, for NOx emissions, this is nitrogen oxide. Again, uh, this uh, medium heavy duty sector is a significant source of, of uh, NOx emissions, so 26%. Uh, NOx, is, as many of you probably know, uh, reacts with volatile organic compounds in the air in presence of sunlight and under um, uh, 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 favorable um, meteorological conditions creates ozone. And because the majority of our volatile organics are from biogenic sources, we know that from past experience that controlling NOx is the way to reduce ozone levels in the state. Next. Next slide, please. And uh, just to, um, wanted to highlight some trends um, with the with our own on-road mobile source emissions here with respect to NOx, which is in the green bar, VOC or volatile organics, which is the red bar, and carbon monoxide. And we've made tremendous progress over the years from 1990 through 2017 
and redu reducing our emissions. Um, but given that the standards um, keep getting lowered, we have to continue to make progress at not only maintaining compliance with our current standards, but looking towards the future to make sure we're in compliance with any future standards. Next slide, please. And this is just a summary of this chart is summarizing um, how we're doing statewide with respect to the ozone standard. And this is looking at, there have been four different standards actually for ozone. We started with the one hour standard uh, back in 1997. And then we um, have the 1997 standard or in 1997, I'm sorry, the one hour standard was discontinued in 97 and, and moved from a one hour to an eight hour standard in 97. And then that standard was lowered in 2008. It was lowered from about 80 parts per million down to 75. And now the 2015 standard, we're at 70 parts per million. And we've been statewide been able to maintain compliance with this most stringent standard. Um, but there's always a chance that it can be lowered in the future. So we want to maintain and continue the show progress and main, maintain and reducing our emissions to ensure um, current and future attainment. Next slide, please. All right, I wanted to touch a little bit on um, the um, Clean Air Act provisions related to adoption of Act and kind of what these steps are. Next slide, please. So the, uh, under um, Section 209 of the Clean Air Act, the state of California is required to request and be granted a waiver from EPA in order to impl implement any vehicle emission standards that are unique, um, not less stringent uh, than the federal standards. And uh, the these the standards um, are uh, basically the, um, hold on a second. Okay, then under Section 177 of the Clean Air Act, other states can choose to adopt the California standards in lieu of any other federal standards. Um, and they are not required to seek EPA approval before California adopts the standards. Um, so as long as EPA approves those California standards, ultimately other states can adopt them. Um, and this has happened actually in the past in one occasion where the, the Environmental Management Commission has adopted a California vehicle emission standard. Um, this is under 15A NCAC O2D uh, uh, 1008 for heavy duty diesel engines. And this was a, a, a situation where um, EPA had applied, this is a heavy duty emission, applied to heavy duty vehicles for the, um, and, and by adopting the standard, we were able to delay implementation of, of those standards for two years uh, to give us some time for compliance. But um, let's move on. Next slide, please. This is um, the Clean Air Act language for Section 177. And I'm not gonna re go through it in detail, but there's some highlighted text here which highlight four principles that are important for um, states that are looking to adopt California standard under section 177. And I'll talk about those in the next slide, please. So these four principles are applicability, identicality, lead time, and the third, what we call the third vehicle prohibition. So section 177 under applicability provides authority of the states with non-attainment plan provisions approved by EPA to, um, that's one of the applicability criteria. So we have to meet that criteria and we do. We have some maintenance plans that are in place um, in the state for Charlotte and um, for the Triangle and Rocky Mount and Great Smoky areas for the uh, ozone standard. And then the next one is the identicality principle. And when adopting and enforcing motor vehicle emission standards, um, section 177 requires that those standards be identical to the California standards for which a waiver has been granted. And sales targets actually do qualify as emission standards. So 
in adopting these California standards, we'll have to adopt those sales targets as is into the North Carolina rule. The other requirement is that, or another requirement is that um, we provide the the act require, or um, section 177 requires a state provide manufacturers, uh, those that are affected by the sales uh, targets, at least two years before uh, commitment, uh, the applicability of the standards to the model year that they're manufacturing. And then there's a prohibition on uh, the standards, uh, either California or federal. Um, the, you can't create a third vehicle or a third engine under when you adopt these standards. That's getting back to the identicality principle. So we'll have to stick with these principles when we're developing the rule. Next slide, please. Okay, and then there are other states uh, that have adopted that uh, ACT, uh, including California, Oregon, or Oregon, Washington, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Vermont. And we are coordinating with those states. Um, so we learned from what their experience is. Um, and I think Colorado is actually on about the same schedule as North Carolina for adopting um, or for developing a rule to adopt that. So I will stop there, Robin, and turn it back to you. Thanks, Randy. So, the next critical step in this whole process includes at the outreach process to make sure we're hearing all the perspectives on what we're doing um, and making sure that we're getting meaningful engagement and involvement from everyone as we prepare to enter our rulemaking process. As Mike said at the beginning, strong stakeholder engagement in, in our efforts is a central part of this program. And the key principles of our outreach progress will um, include great two-way communication, information sharing, providing formal and informal opportunities for input, strong stakeholder engagement, which includes building relationships and fostering participation with environmental and community groups in this clean transportation initiative. And of course, folks like Randy and others on our skilled technical staff will be undertaking an analysis of the benefits and costs of the proposed rulemaking action so that we will have time or so that we will have that information to inform our decision making process. Next slide, please. So this is our tentative timeline for our rulemaking process. Um, our concept has already gone to um, the uh, um, air quality committee. Um, a, a draft rule and a fiscal note will go to the air quality committee in May. Um, and then in July, we'll have a request to proceed to public comment and hearing, and that goes to the environmental uh, management commission. We'll have a uh, public process and hearings uh, in the late summer. And then in through um, November, we'll have our hearing officer who will report will develop the report and um, we'll move forward for adoption. And then a potential effective date will be in January of 2024. Next slide, please. But this is where everyone who's on the call today can help us. Today's our information session. We're telling you what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, we will have an in-person stakeholder meeting in Charlotte um, this Friday. And if you have not registered for that, please do so. Those in-person meetings are registration only. We'll follow that with a meeting in Burlington and another one in Pembroke. And then we'll have a final stakeholder input webinar. So if you're unable to make any of the in-person meetings, you can join another webinar on February 1st. And then in the middle of February, we'll have a final stakeholder webinar that will summarize what we have heard from all of you and where we are in our process. I will, like, I will invite you, if you cannot attend an in-person meeting, but you sign up for one, Go ahead and tell us that you're not going to make it to those because um, 
seating is limited in some of those spaces, and we'd like to open it up to the next people on the line. Next slide, please. I'd like to remind everybody that today's webinar has been recorded and the slides will be available on our website listed here. And if you can't make a meeting at all, virtual or in person, you're more than welcome to send us a comment by email or phone. Email is listed here and our phone number is listed here and we are monitoring those frequently. Next slide, please. Um, here's our contact information. You can reach me, Robin Barrows, or Sean Taylor about our outreach or public information sessions. Questions about rural development should be directed to Randy Strait or Mike Abersnetskis. Next slide, please. And we'll now take any questions that anyone might have about today's presentation and about the upcoming outreach meetings. We do ask stakeholders to wait to provide feedback and input on the proposed rules until the upcoming in-person or virtual stakeholder meetings, however. So, India, do we have anyone on the line who has raised their hand or put anything in the chat for a question? I don't see any raised hands. Um... Okay. Okay, so there are a few questions I need to do right now. First question is Is it possible to get a copy of the presentation? You already answered. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, the presentation will be available on our website um, for folks to see. It will probably be up there tomorrow and not this afternoon. Cool. Um, so I want to ask, will this include all school and education buses? Uh, as far as I know, school buses um, are part of this rulemaking, but I'm going to let Randy or Zach answer that question. Yes, they are. But I should say that transit buses are not. And the reason is because California has a separate rule for transit buses. So they did not include them in the advanced clean trucks rule because they're addressed under separate rule. And then someone has their hand raised, so I'm going to unmute them. If you want to go ahead and ask your question, you've been unmuted. Oh. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I noticed where you're, you're having those uh, in-person hearings or public hearings. I live here in Northampton County. I'm home to an Inviva uh, plant. Uh, we also have West Rock, which is a paper mill where we have uh, traffic 24-7, log trucks, um, trucks uh, supporting uh, pellets and all of that. Uh, will you all, because we're very impacted by this, and I'm wondering, will anybody ever come to this area um, to we, have an in-person meeting? Um, if you would like to um, call the phone number, send me an email directly, um, and my contact information is, will be on, is on the website already, then we will see what we can do. I can't promise we can do that right now, which is why we have the, um, the second um, virtual meeting. Thank you. Absolutely. Cool. I have one other person that has their hand raised. You've been unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Farm equipment and construction vehicles. What are you defining as a vehicle, or is that part of the rulemaking process? Um, Ms. Thomas, we're having a hard time hearing you. Could you speak up a little bit? Yes. Um, so, the executive order exempts farm equipment and construction vehicles. My my question is also in the Q and A. 
that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So our question is executive order 271 exempts farm equipment and construction vehicles. What are those vehicles? Zach, would you like to handle that or Randy? I can jump in. Basically, the advanced clean trucks rule applies only to on-road vehicles. So farm equipment and construction vehicles is a pretty um, broadly defined term, but basically any vehicles that are operating in an off-road capacity at a construction site uh, in an agricultural setting, those are separate from the vehicles in classes 2B through 8 that are considered as part of the Advanced Clean Trucks program. Okay. So we have a question, why U.S. class 2B3 is not set to 70%? Did you say that again, India? Why, oh, sorry. Why is class 2B3 not set to 70%? Randy, do we have an answer? I, I'm not sure that I have an answer for that one right now. Yeah, Robin, I'm reading the comment. I'm not sure I understand the question either. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, perhaps if you, if you have an opportunity, it, maybe. If you have maybe. an opportunity to come to a stakeholder meeting, um, you can ask that in person. Yeah. Zach, do you have a thought? Well, I can take a stab. So, I think maybe the question is getting to the fact that the sales requirements are not uniform across all of the vehicle classes in a given year you know there's a discrepancy between 2b through 3 versus class 4 through 8 versus class 7 and 8 tractors um, mm -hmm. a lot of that goes back to my understanding is a lot of the, those um, percentages go back to the economic modeling economic analysis technology forecasting that California undertook when they developed the advanced clean trucks rule. And as Randy mentioned, under the Clean Air Act, our, the tools at our disposal are to opt into these sales requirements. So we don't have the ability to change the sales requirements, but certainly um, have been um, thoroughly evaluated. The other thing I'll just note is, and this is a little bit of a answer in the weeds, but although there are different sales share requirements for different vehicle classes. There is an ability for manufacturers to generate um, credits that they can exchange between some of the vehicle classes, which allows for some um, interaction between uh, different vehicle classes based on the market progressing at, at different speeds and, and manufacturers that may be selling a particular type of, of vehicle. So that's one of the functions of the rule that in our eyes allows for uh, some flexibility for the manufacturers themselves. Hope that helps answer. So, can you explain the chart about Zev sale targets by year? Is this a schedule other states or California are using? And would we come in at the 2027 numbers? Zach, you want to want me to take that, or you want to take it? Um, sh sure. I mean, it's a similar. Mm -hmm. I can start and then Randy, you can clean up for all the things that I maybe misstate, but I'll just <laughs> my, the quick answer is basically we would come in in the model 2027 sales requirements. So, um, we, uh, we would be at the same level of stringency in the model year, as opposed to starting in 2026 on the 2024 sales requirements, if that makes sense. So that goes back to those identicality requirements of one mm -hmm. single state standard. That's right, Zach. We would have to adopt that table as is into our rule. Other states have done the same. Um, is it possible for North Carolina to go beyond the California Act parameters to include transit buses? That would, I believe, have to be a separate rule. Um, we we would have to. Um, it's not included, and in, since they're not included in the uh, advanced clean trucks rule, we we have to adopt that as is. So I think that would have to be addressed separately. Is the proposed rule currently available, and if so, where can we get a copy of it? It is not available. 
we will be developing that through our rulemaking process. And I think um, the first look of that, what it'll look like would be at um, the May a Air Quality Committee meeting. Um, we'll be taking the uh, proposed rules and fiscal note to the Air Quality Committee meeting for their consideration um, in May. At their May meeting, it, and I think yeah, Robin, the the schedule at the end of the presentation covers that, right? Yeah. I would just add, you know, there as as Randy mentioned, there are a number of states that have already adopted a version of this rule. So you could you could certainly review that that draft or final um, uh, rule language if you wanted to get a sense of uh, how this rule has been promulgated mm -hmm. in other states and. As we've discussed, you know, there are, there are some variations, but a limited uh, amount of variations that North Carolina can take to develop our own advanced clean truck rule. Yeah, that's right. What might happen if a manufacturer doesn't meet the sales targets in the rulemaking will penalties be con contemplated? Yes, um, there is a provision in the advanced clean trucks California's rule that includes penalties and we'll be looking at that um, as we take it through the rulemaking process and, and receive comment on it. And this appears to be one of the areas where public feedback is going to be helpful um, because it's an area where North Carolina can deviate from exactly what California has in their rule. Mm -hmm. So we have one last question and one person raising their hand. Um, I'm gonna go to Veronica Saltzman real quick. So just say she had her hand raised before this last question came in. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. Hi, thanks. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, the, the ACT in California um, allows manufacturers, it seems to earn credits by selling electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles based on the definition of zero emission vehicle. And I was wondering if you consider that to be something you had to adopt as well under the identicality requirement. Yes, I think we want to look at that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that is another area and this will be um, further delved into in the in the upcoming stakeholder meetings, but that is another area where we anticipate there may be some flexibility for North Carolina in terms of how credits are utilized. Are there targets for anti-idling systems for hard to electrify applications like emergency services? Maybe I can take this just to so I don't have a, so the answer is no, there are not targets um, within this rule, but I think it reiterates a point that we've made earlier in the presentation that advanced clean trucks is a com important component of a larger strategy to reduce emissions in the transportation sector writ large and specifically within these medium and heavy duty vehicles. And so we would encourage folks to for many of you, continue engaging in the clean transportation plan process um, or to engage if that's a, a new um, project for you, because that's going to be the venue that the state is also going to work on complementary strategies to reduce emissions, to build out the infrastructure, to support the growth of the workforce, et cetera, to ensure that there is a healthy ecosystem that's going to be ensuring that there's a demand for these zero emission vehicles as we move um, forward. Okay, so we have one last hand raised. You should be unmuted. Go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, my question is um, here at Downey, our, our mantra is we're on a, um, a path of, uh, of just and tr transition towards a goal 100% renewable. And, and with that, we're, we're concerned that communities that have traditionally uh, been um, kind of exploited economically will have an opportunity to benefit economically uh, from, uh, from, this, from this plan. Can you talk, you, you mentioned briefly about one of the, one of the steps 
but can you talk a little bit about how uh, communities that have traditionally been extracted upon uh, black and brown communities, how they will benefit from the implementation of this plan or will big big business like Duke and other big companies buy up the, uh, uh, the, these opportunities uh, and just this, this process continue? Um, I, I can take a shot at that one if you want, Zach. Um, it is our, our, our goal and our, and our objective to in, be as inclusive of all communities as we possibly can across the state. Um, and, and, and I offer that if you have specific questions and you want to reach out to me personally, um, then you can do that. Uh, my contact information is on the one of the last slides. Um, India, if you could share that outreach timeline, um, this, is, this is the, um, we don't have any time for any more questions today, but I do encourage you to tune in to our in-person stakeholder meetings um, at, or our, in our stakeholder input webinar that is in February. Um, and as we work through this process and as we work through our rulemaking, we're going to continue to reach back out to everyone. Um, so that you know where we are and you know that um, your voices are being heard. So thank you for your time today. We appreciate everybody's input and everybody's time. And I know your time is precious. So um, we hope to see you soon at an in-person meeting. Thank you. Thank you.